Hello, my name is Anne Marie Cannon, and I'm the host of Armchair Historians. What's your favorite history? Each episode begins with this one question. Our guests come from all walks of life. YouTube celebrities, comedians, historians, even neighbors from the small mountain community that I live in. They're people who love history and get really excited about a particular time, place, or person from our distant or not so distant past. The jumping off point is the place where they became curious, then entered the rabbit hole into discovery. Fueled by an unrelenting need to know more, we look at history through the filter of other people's eyes. Armchair Historians is a Belgian Rabbit production. Stay up to date with us through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Wherever you listen to your podcast, that is where you'll find us. Armchair Historians is an independent, commercial-free podcast. If you'd like to support the show and keep it ad-free, you can buy us a cup of coffee through Ko-fi, or you can become a patron through Patreon. Links to both in the episode notes. Today, my guest is Karina Belize, host and producer of Care More, Be Better, a podcast that shares stories of inspired individuals, social entrepreneurs, and conscious companies from around the globe who create a positive impact in their communities. Today, Karina reaches back to her early academic days when she was studying anthropology as an undergraduate student at university. She shares with us her take on a topic that she fell in love with then and is still passionate about today, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, better known as Neanderthal. Now, I want you to think of the word Neanderthal. What comes to mind? Is it a hulking, unintelligent caveman? Or perhaps the Geico commercials that feature the all too misunderstood species? So while you listen to this episode, I want you to think about where your messaging about the Neanderthal species came from. And perhaps, just maybe, you will even begin to question your beliefs about the species whose DNA we only recently discovered is part of the human genome. Karina Belizzi, welcome and thank you for being here today. Well, thank you so much for having me. So we talked a little bit about the history you're going to talk about, and I don't have a lot of information, but I have one thing that I'll contribute. So why don't you just take us there and tell us what is your favorite history that you're going to talk about today? Well, my favorite history is actually a prehistory. Now, what defines history is essentially the written word, having a written record, having the ability to go back and see somebody's perspective on the things that happened. And what I loved so much when I was first going to college was learning about anthropology and picturing a world that hadn't been written down, one in which we had to go from the solid materials that were left behind or the cave paintings to really kind of discover what human life would have been like without somebody's perspective to color it. It's almost like taking a biological perspective into what our history really is. And as I explored and deepened my own interest in anthropology, I got really enamored with the Neanderthal species. And I think partly that may have come from reading Clan of the Cave Bears when I was, you know, a young girl, just kind of discovering my own wants and desires if I wanted to read something for fun. You know, when I was growing up in the 80s, Daryl Hannah played this character, and I think it was a made-for-TV movie. And I just kind of fell in love then. I fell in love further with Indiana Jones, and it was like, I think I was at an age where I was exploring what I wanted to be in life. And so it was something that just opened my mind and continued to get me seeking. And when I learned about the Neanderthal in particular, the thing that fascinated me was that they cohabitated with modern Homo sapiens in Western Europe for over 30,000 years. So the question I got to thinking about was, what would it have been like to live with a species that's different from you, inhabiting the same space for that long. Almost every other species on the planet has that. And the closest thing we have today in our modern life is a chimpanzee. I mean, I've often encountered people who didn't believe in evolutionary thought, who say things like, oh, well, I'm not condescended from a chimpanzee. (laughs) 
<laughs> and they just don't understand what evolution really means. I think that's ultimately at the root of it. But there was this whole thought process as I was going to undergraduate school. Can I just ask you, if, and I know if you don't want to say, tell no, me it's okay. What mm -hmm. year was that? Because I was just reading about the things that we found out about Neanderthal in just the past 10 years, I think. Yeah. So I was in college as early as 93. In my senior year in high school, okay. I started attending classes at De Anza College while I was figuring out what I wanted to do and what I might want to study. And so I took my first anthropology class with Tiza Abshir Walker, who at the time, I had no idea what her background was. She ends up being, she's actually a Stanford schooled PhD in anthropology, incredibly bright, incredibly charismatic. At the time I had a class from her, she was, I think in her 60s, white haired, and talking about really controversial topics, right? Like our whole thought process around Neanderthals, she thought was quite antiquated. And what she had to say about that was that there was a really good reason. And that good reason was that what she called DWEMs, dead white European males, <laughs> had basically written our history of archaeology. And that these people had essentially hung on to their tenure and in their positions at universities and doing research until their dying breaths that these coveted positions didn't often come open. And when they did, they were occupied by other European white males who further perpetuated the same ideas or similar ideas to what had been seen in the past. And so what she described to me at that phase was, was something that resonated with me because it was something I saw even just in our culture here in the United States. Like it seems like histories are written by those who who win the war or, you know, what we're taught in school is so focused on the perspective of the winner, which is, I think, what ultimately got me so interested in prehistory, because there was no one there to say what actually happened. You had to go to the science to figure it out. And while that was true, there was still that cohort of dead white European males that had their thoughts essentially leading where the science would go or where perspective would go. So when you ask the question about how much things have changed in the last 10 years, I mean, it has been dramatic. When I was writing my thesis at UC Santa Cruz, I graduated in 1998, right? So my thesis was in winter of 98. I graduated December that year. And I decided to write on the capabilities of Neanderthal to have modern speech capabilities oh, to wow. communicate with other homo sapiens living at the time. And here's something that your audience may not know. We are homo sapiens sapiens. We have named ourselves wise, wise man, because sapiens means wise. Okay. So wise, wise man is actually what we've called ourselves. Neanderthals are homo sapiens neanderthalensis. So they are only a subgenus, so to speak. They're part of the same species. And we, however, continue to try and separate ourselves from them for all of my education path. There was Eric Trinkaus. He's a Neanderthal specialist, had written a book specifically about the Neanderthals after a hyoid bone had been discovered. And a hyoid bone, it's just a bone in your throat by your larynx that is you know, really has a lot to do with speech capabilities in modern human beings. And so he was making all of these scientific suppositions about their ability to speak and what that could have meant for the 30,000 years that we lived side by side in Western Europe, right? So if we lived side by side in Western Europe for 30 years and the entire academic world is trying to say, oh, well, they might have lived side by side, but they didn't share technology. They might have lived side by side, but they didn't interbreed. I mean, they were too different. These were dumb, big, oafish people that didn't represent this refined human perspective. I mean, that was everything of what we were being taught. While I had more, I would say, professors that were a little bit more open to the alternative and the possibility that, hey, maybe they did speak and maybe they did interbreed. And do we know if they were physically capable of actually breeding or not? And of course, a few years ago, we found that 
that we were able to extract the DNA from teeth in a particular Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, right? A Neanderthal. And we were able to sequence that genome. And then we were able to analyze modern Homo sapiens genes and say, guess what? This is actually present in our current genome. That means that Neanderthals did breed with modern Homo sapiens. Well, and that's my one contribution. I was looking at my 23andMe because 2% Neanderthal. (laughs) Yeah, you know, and it's like if you were from Western Europe... The reality is that you are likely to have more. Right. And so I'm I have I took my 23andMe specifically to find out <laughs> how much Neanderthal I have by reference to the rest of the population. And I have more Neanderthal than 34% of the current human pop- population from what they've been able to see. Okay, yeah, I have more than 37, so we're about the same. Wow. Yeah. So so I think the natural question then becomes what is different between us, right? What was different? What does the evidence show was really that different? You know, what we see is that their bodies were a little bit more robust, right? Their brains were actually quite different from our own. And that is what is really fascinating to me. The Neanderthal brain was actually a little bit larger than modern Homo sapiens by a couple hundred cc. But what was different about it is that it had less crenulations. It was less ribbed, so to speak, which modern people in evolutionary science have come to say, well, that means that they had less dendrites or less neurons firing or less of an ability to have the same cognition as modern Homo sapiens. But the reality is we don't really know. We don't really know how different they were. All we have are these endocranial casts or basically the cast of what would have been the skull, right? We're able to take that and see what looks different from the outside. And what this gets me to thinking about is really how different are we between species that are similar, like among the monkeys and chimpanzees, apes, uh, orangutan, whatever, and other species that are far less related to us. I mean, we have this sense, we have this continual kind of quest, it seems, to try and separate ourselves from other species as if we're somehow better. We're wise, wise man, right? Right. And I just don't think that as science continues to advance, that that is going to continue to be proven. In fact, we just keep disproving it. We say first, oh, what separates us from animals is that we use tools. Oh, well, a chimpanzee uses a tool. Oh, well, no, no, no. Uh, What separates us from animals is that we modify tools. Oh, well, the chimpanzee modifies a tool. Oh, and so does a crow. So, So what is uniquely human? And I would argue that really almost nothing except for war. (laughs) You know, it's like we have this tribal nature that has some really great things about it. This sense of community, the sense of helping one another, the sense of being there to support the health of our population or our, our grandparents and our children or those that are less abled or differently abled than ourselves. Yet... What do we do? We create things like war to to battle one another for resources in a way that is more brutal than one you often see in the other parts of the animal kingdom. I might even go on to say that the other thing that goes hand in hand with war is ego. <laughs> and that ego wise wise man. <laughs> ego is a downfall of a lot of things and people and myself included that pig headedness pig headedness what's the latin for that i don't know why can't we just say i don't know i don't know yeah why that's... can't we get more comfortable with the it could be maybe i and one of the things that i love about this in the way that you're explaining it is that i love history i've studied history i've written historical fiction and one of the thing that comes to mind is that there was a belief that this particular there was a particular instrument medieval whatever and they believed that it was written that it didn't come into being until like the 1700s and why why was why did that become a fact because it wasn't written down but mm. in the 15 at some point in the mid 1500s there was a ship that sunk in the what is now the English Channel 
and it was called the Mary Rose. And in that ship was a lot of well-preserved artifacts. So when it was brought up in the 1980s, it enlightened us about a lot of things. And one of those things was that instrument that was actually found on that ship. And so I think what this tells me and you know, I didn't start to realize until more recently, and kudos to you that you had those professors and the open-mindedness to think about things in the way that you did back in the 1990s and be so controversial. Well, just to be honest, I think you were just being, you were on a quest for truth, right? Yeah. I mean, I just feel like we've been sold a book of lies as we have studied history in school. Yes, I think one of the things that I found most frustrating about history and in school, I'm talking about high school, elementary, etc. And probably the reason I didn't really want to study it was everything seemed so sequentially organized. Like I was supposed to remember the date that something happened. And I was supposed to memorize a thing that some particular person said, but it didn't have a frame of context that was meaningful for me. And I think part of that is in how history is taught in school, just in the public school system. But I think part of that is really getting to not being willing to really form a context for people for fear of stepping on their personal beliefs and raising problems with their parents. And I'm speaking in particular of religion when I when I talk about that, because I think it gets in the way of us being able to have open conversations about things that may be a little controversial, that may be open, that don't have an answer. I just wish that we could get a little smarter about how we educate our our student body from that perspective so that we raise inquisitive individuals who are seeking to have a better understanding of the context of the why. So we don't keep repeating the same problems and keep repeating the same mistakes. That's really important. And I had an experience in college when I went to, uh, I actually went to a community college when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I never really liked history. I never had a connection to it. And that connection is so important because I ended up with a teacher who taught history and every day it was a great story. She taught it like it was this epic story. And I couldn't wait to go to her class because It had context, meaningful context to me. And I think that's really important and enlightening what you said. I think you had that experience also in uh, college, right? So Yeah, I did. I mean, there was just this moment too, when an instructor is really inspired to open your mind, when they come from that perspective, when they're tackling the job of giving a lecture, it changes everything about the experience of the students. And I had no idea how lucky I was to be in that classroom, that Anthro 101 with Tiza Abshire Walker. I had no idea until it started. One of the, can we cuss on this show? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. So she gave this lecture and I, I described her already. Like she's in her 60s, white haired old lady. And she gave this lecture on the entomology of the word, uh, the etymology of the word fuck. Oh, okay. And so she went way back and started talking about how this word came to be and how it first started as almost an uprising against the royalty of England. And its first use was in the 15th or 14th century. I can't remember which. And it, and so she goes from talking about it was first deemed as an insult as you are being a fuck. And if you fucked something, you were it didn't have anything to do with sex. That's the thing. It was it was really just this lower class of individuals that was working to kind of raise up against the monarchy, so to speak. And I remember very little of the lecture, except for the fact that I was just sitting there jaw dropping over the (laughs) fact that this 60 something year old woman was saying the F word like a hundred (laughs) times in a variety of capacities in a variety of ways over the course of an hour. You had me at fuck. (laughs) Right. It's just like, this is not something that you expect, right? And just by being in a lecture with somebody where you had this really unexpected experience, 
just got you thinking differently and got you more engaged. And suddenly I was going from a student who may have dragged my feet on the way to certain classes to I had that spring in my step saying, you know, well, what else can I find out today? And even classes that weren't related at all to hers, just because that inspiration had got inside my belly. And I think it was just so meaningful to me to see something done in such a different way in a traditional classroom setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I think back to all the moments over my life when I've been in an educational system and all of the moments that I dreaded going to that history class to only find that I, you know, spent four years studying prehistory <laughs> because one teacher opened my eyes to seeing something a little differently and asking questions about what might have been. I have another kind of anecdote about the Neanderthals. Like this relates back to how we saw them as different, right? Yeah. You know, we got to a split, a place where we described what was different between Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens sapiens, wise, wise man and Neanderthals. And these professionals leading the charge would say, oh, they were different because they were different because, oh, their brains were different. Oh, you know, they didn't have the same art that we had. And so if you look at what was happening in Western Europe 30,000 years ago, suddenly you see this explosion of fixed art with art in caves, right? Mm -hmm. In France. Yeah, yeah, all over France, Lascaux, yeah. Spain, there's Lascaux too. There's all these different spaces that you can go to to see replications of those artist renderings. And also just all over the Americas too, like we just see this explosion starting around 30,000 years ago. And so when I think about that, what happened, right? Like Neanderthals had been living with modern Homo sapiens over the course of about 30,000 years up until around that point, up until around that point, when suddenly there was this explosion. And so that gets me to wondering if there was perhaps some unique kind of influence that came from Neanderthal DNA into modern Homo sapiens that literally created something new. Because that period of life, what we refer to as this around 30,000 30, years ago, where we start to see fixed art, not just the mobile art, not just the things that they bring around with them, you know, like the Venus statues that you might have seen, or the stone tools, or the jewelry that you might have seen um, from different archaeological, uh, archaeological digs. Then you see this explosion of, you know, really fixed art that doesn't precede that moment. So could it be that right around the time that we see Neanderthals phase out, They've essentially come in to our species and changed it. And if something around that moment happened and this supposed behavioral modern experience, this behaviorally modern human became behaviorally modern, not only through evolution, but through influence from the Neanderthal species. And that's something I think about it. I don't know if it's anything that could ever be proven but to just try and think differently about the things that we're taught in school. Mm -hmm. We're not just man, we're wise, wise man. Well, what makes us so wise? I mean, shouldn't it be the skepticism and the seeking and the thinking that makes us wise? Being able to sit in the discomfort instead of going to war, have the difficult <sighs> conversations. Yeah. Well, and just share technology, share resources. Like, why can't we get to a space where we can say, you know, there's enough diamonds in the world for everyone to have one. Let's stop making this, you know, some precious gem that we will wage wars over or that individuals will die mining for. Like, why do we have to have that existence? Why do we have to have that human experience? Can we shift? Can we move to something different? Well, let me ask you that question. Why can't we? <laughs> I don't ask you think your it's, own question. Yeah, I don't think it's a we can't. I, I think there's resistance to change that is also endemic in our species. Like we, in particular, after about the age of 30, resist change, resist learning something new, resist trying to discover new music. I mean, there's statistics about this, that people actually stop discovering new music often in their early 30s. Like by the early 30s, it's like their music taste is fixed. It doesn't change. They don't find new things. They might not even listen to new music. So if there's a way that we can move forward and past that, where we all kind of seek to embrace 
a continual learning throughout our lives, if we can all accept that we don't know what we don't know and seek to continue learning, then I think we can shift out of it. But there's resistance to even that. I'm guilty. I have to say I'm guilty of all those things. And yet putting new things in is always vital. There's like a vitality to learning new things and hearing new things and thinking in different ways. And yet I I have to say I'm that person. I'm way past 30. And yeah. Well, there's comfort in what you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of comfort in what you know. Like, what do you reach for when you're feeling sick? It's probably the same basic staple foods that you had when you were a little kid. It's not likely to be something new, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's comfort in it. It's a worn path. I think forging new trails is important. I think continuing to read and learn is important. I mean, I'm 44 now and I just started, I embarked on a graduate studies two years ago. I'll be graduating this June with an MBA from Santa Clara University. And I would have never thought that my path would lead me there. You know, I'm, what did I start out as? This hopeful little kid that wanted to be Indiana Jones. I graduated with a degree in anthropology, writing a thesis about Neanderthal modern speech capabilities based on lithic reduction sequences and stone tools. Like what stone tools had to say about the share of technology. That's what I was looking at. What did I end up doing? I ended up going into natural products and sales, marketing and spending 20 years doing that before I decided I wanted to go get my MBA, which is again, not related to anything in anthropology or archaeology. So why? Why did I make that choice? I did want to ask you um, just to kind of stay with the history before we delve deeply into who you are, where you come from, and what work you're putting out in the universe today. I'd like to ask you, one of the things you already kind of touched on is where do we see this history in pop culture? And you said Clan Clan of the Cave Bear was one that I thought of. Yeah. Yeah, we see, uh, we see the, God, Neanderthals have never been portrayed in the kindest of light. Yeah. It's interesting because we see them as brutish. Yeah. If you look at cartoons from, you know, evolutionary science history over the course of the years, they were essentially these lumbering hulks of people with wood stick that they'd clobber you over the head with or hunt for mammoths, right? You'd see in the clan of the cave bear, you're exposed to this species that is seen as really rudimentary, only grunting, not having the ability to speak. The primary character who is played by Daryl Hannah in the movie is, you know, seen in a rape scene where she's taken by this hulk of a person that is seen as depicted as lesser than modern homo sapiens. So even, you know, in that first exposure, when I was first discovering what this caveman was like, I was being influenced in a way by our culture to think of this other as bad. That's something that we encounter kind of constantly in our culture today. Like you, you see this hate towards other from one group to another. It's like kind of like connected to that tribalism I was speaking of earlier. That same thing that bonds us together also has the capacity to create some toxicity and dislike between groups or prejudice between groups. So I feel like how we have seen the Neanderthal for the bulk of my living life and the bulk of history Mm -hmm. is of this other brutish and kind of necessarily bad in the perspective of pop culture. And that's only starting to change a little bit as we understand that we have 2% or 3% of Neanderthal DNA Mm -hmm. in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Well, I also thought of the insurance commercials where the Neanderthal characters, I can't remember if it's Geico, it's probably Geico. <laughs> probably. But is. do you know which one I'm talking about? I think I've seen it. I don't really remember it clearly. Where they're like they're really actually the cerebral ones, but they're tired and they're tired of being depicted the way that they're depicted. And <sighs> um they're actually very funny commercials. Because it kind of embodies this whole idea of how misunderstood uh, Neanderthals really have been based on that. What did you call them? The 
the dead white European dead men. white European male <laughs> dwems, right? Like the dwems, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you remember Clan of the Cave Bear, if you read that book, um, I saw the movie. If you read the books, which is an entire series, it ends up being almost like a romance novel. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of sex in those books, which is, I think, probably also why I wanted to read them at 12 and 13 <laughs> years old, right? <laughs> but, you know, if I look to their their theory about what was different, what they shared was that the Neanderthals in that book series like had this memory of generations, like thinking about how their brain was different. Perhaps they actually had some sort of stored memory where they could remember the lives of the communities that existed before them somehow or something kind of magical along those lines. But I think that also leans to considering the Neanderthal more like an animal, more based on instinct, which is, I think, also still kind of a common thought. Like we would just see them as, you know, more animal-like than human-like. Which is just, it's, you know, we don't know. Like, that's the reality. Know. We just don't know. And as, as, as technology advances, the more we know, the more we realize how wrong we've been. The Dwems have really ruled, and based on what? Their egos. Or just what was the path that has been well worn, you know, like oh, from Socrates true. to present. You're kinder like, than I am. <laughs> you know, they, they get used to a particular idea. Okay. And that particular idea gets passed on and it gets passed on and gets passed on. And one of the things I really love about science, scientific theory in general is that it's, you know, really seeking to prove and replicate what your ideas are and being open to being disproven. I mean, how many times in my lifetime now have we considered Pluto a planet or not right now? I mean, I don't know if it ever will affect me personally to beyond just being like, no, when I learned when I was in school, it was a planet. So it's got to stay a planet, right? Because that's a well-worn path for me. But it doesn't have any real impact in my daily life. You know, the sorts of things that I think we need to be concerned with as we head forward, particularly through this time when there's so much polarizing thought out there. Mm -hmm is that we are more similar than we're different. There's actually no difference between the races and we're all the same race. We're the human race. All of our differences are essentially skin deep. And, you know, there are a few very minor, like, physical traits that exist beyond the grave where you can analyze bones and see small differences like the orbital ridge is slightly sharper in my eye or I have a more pronounced shoveling in the back of my teeth which is an indication of Mongolian history and guess what I take the 23 and me test and they show me you know no eastern asian ancestry so what does that say i mean maybe the test isn't even completely accurate right because well, they're constantly mm. changing it for ancestry, they're like they're taking away some of the things that they told me I was, and they're updating their algorithm or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's constantly changing. Yeah, I'm a few weeks ago I was two percent Norwegian. Now I'm not at all. Now I have Malta on my history, so I'm like, oh, more North yeah. African. Awesome. That's co it's you confusing. Know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing is, we, we still don't know what we don't know. Right. And we should still be in a discovery mode. And we should remember that we are one species and that our neighbors don't have wants and desires that are all that different from our own. And seek to understand one another and lock our arms together and get through the difficult times together, like the time of COVID. I mean, this has been an insane year. And if I look back on my entire, the history of, of all the prehistory that I've read over the years too, you know, I don't know that I could put my finger on a single time that is, that I've studied where it's been this kind of toxic and crazy where human connection has been more challenged because of, you know, a disease that can just wipe out a significant portion of the population. It's been a difficult time to be alive. <laughs> yeah. It has been. That coupled with the political climate over the past four years. But <sighs> we don't need to go there because I keep, when you're talking, I'm like, she's she's a better person than I am. And that's probably not the right way to put it. But oh, I just no. have such a knot in my stomach when I think about reaching out to what I consider the other, the other side. So I've never felt this polarized from a part of the population in all of my life 
than I have. So I, I am part of that maybe problem, you know, where mm. I think we all are. And, and, you know, so this is what goes on in my mind. So I need to take a look at myself, but are they doing that? No. So this is where like my thinking goes and then it just builds up all this energy. Mm -hmm. And that's a negative thought cycle to get stuck into. You know, I think one of the the bits of knowledge that I have gleaned from the past few years of my life is that if we spend more time together, if we actually talk and connect with people that we disagree with, typically you're able to mend bridges. It's a path that is more uncomfortable than some. I, I mean, there's this whole perspective of, I can't remember the exact person's name, but he's an African-American male that started to to befriend people in the KKK to try and kind of change their minds through friendship and actually was successful in converting a couple of people to walk away from that because they had this one framed idea of how Black people were. And because they had this singularly framed idea of who this other was, they had developed all sorts of prejudiced thoughts about what that other person was like. Uh, similarly, I was listening to a podcast recently where an individual had a roommate that was from a completely different religion, and they had a lot of ideas that were very dissimilar. And over the course of living with one another and eating meals together and cooking with one another, essentially became best friends and how that changed their perspective on the other person's culture. And so what I think we need to keep in mind is that we really aren't that different. And if we can find commonality with one another, we can actually bridge gaps, we can solve complex problems, and we can start to see one another as the same as opposed to different, but it doesn't come without work. And people have to be willing and open to doing the work. And I think that's the hardest thing. That's very insightful. There's a lot of, there's a lot of truth in that. There, I, I see it. I feel it. Even though it brushes up against that, you know, what is it, that tribal mentality in me? Or, you know, it's hard to look at oneself. And so it's easy to get defensive. And I think that's what happens often when you have two polarizing opposite ideas in the same room, right? Like one person will get defensive about their beliefs. I mean, I've even had it where um, <laughs> I just I just actually interviewed somebody for my podcast about sustainable minimalism. And I consider myself to be a sustainability champion and I try to be minimalist. minimalist. But even reading a book about minimalism I mean, sometimes I had to put it down because I felt I felt judged by the book <laughs> with the words on the page. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I look too much like that. Am I a pack rat? Like, you know, like I have this hard time letting go of things. I'm obviously internalizing too much. Yeah. Some of these judgments about myself, like could have, should have, didn't, would have. And I think we just have to give ourselves a pass, you know? Yeah. Give Thank ourselves a that. break. <laughs> I I needed to hear that today. I really needed to hear that. Thank you. I was just thinking about, you know, the the differences. And there was a a really interesting effort in San Francisco. This gentleman created this kosher halal company where he's doing both things at once. And there aren't many that are doing that, right? Because you have the people that want a kosher product and the people that want a halal product. And the practices are quite similar. So you could certify both, but no company had really taken the charge to do that. So he decided to. And he also decided to launch a conversation with Abe's Kitchen. So he would host these dinners. And this is, of course, before COVID, and he'll probably get back to it soon. But he would host these dinners where he mm -hmm. brought together people that were Muslim and people that were Jewish and also people that had no faith, like atheists, together for these dinners. And he would organize the seating arrangement so that you didn't have any people of the particular faith sitting together. 
And so by doing this, his whole quest was to essentially enable people to open that conversation with one another and discover that their differences were less than they had thought. And so one of the stories that he works to tell is about the people that would come to him after the dinner and talk to him about it. Like they'd say, oh, well, that made me really uncomfortable, but I actually want to talk to you about this because it got me thinking about X, Y, and Z differently. I think that's where we kind of need to head as a people. We need to to be able to create these opportunities, these spaces where we can connect as opposed to only hearing our own points of view. Because as we look at social media, we are essentially being fed what we want to hear. And that is not encouraging an inquisitive mind. Um, We follow the particular news channels that are telling us the things that we agree with already, or the things that we have been taught to be concerned about in a particular way, and then we're not hearing the other side. It's like the, the old journalism of our youths seems to have died. And I think we should seek to try and replace that with more truth and a broader perspective. If we can kind of push in this perspective where we're we're seeking to be informed in an open way and able to extend a hand across an aisle to somebody who has a differing point of view, I think that would be tremendous progress. I'm would you host a dinner with people of different faiths? Like after, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. wouldn't that be so interesting? I just. Yeah. I, I, I was married mm. to a Muslim, a Palestinian Muslim. Uh, he's the father of my daughter. And it, it's been interesting watching her evolve and grow up. You know, she embodies that because she would go and spend summers with her grandmother in Jordan and she learned how to cook and she was really tapped into the the culture and the rituals and really that's when my eyes opened up was when i traveled to kuwait to meet my in-laws back in the i guess it was the 80s and i saw that how narrow minded we tend to be if we're in this country and we don't move out of especially like the the towns that we grew up in and we don't move out of that. And, you know, I did write, it really enlightened me and I started seeing the world in a very different way. And unlike you, you seem to intuitively have your own sense of, I don't know, morality when you were in college, even probably before that, I admired that about you, that you were able to see through what you had been fed. And with this new information that you're getting, we're able to you know, write that paper for your thesis. So I, everything you're saying, I know to be true. I, for myself, have struggled because to protect myself for four years, I had to, you know, put a, mm-hmm. literally a wall, yeah. a figurative wall to survive. And I don't even know that I did that. But what you're saying is true. And I know that. And um, I'm glad that you're sharing this with me. Kind of your thank you for taking me down the rabbit hole. <laughs> it is a rabbit hole because <laughs> That's a- they ring true. And so, is there anything else about the history that you wanted to talk about before we kind of delve into who you are and your podcast? And- yeah, you know, I think the takeaway I would want anyone to walk away from a conversation about history with is simply that. You know, we only have the perspectives that have been written down or studied, and we don't have everything. We never have the complete picture. As hard as we'll work, we'll never have the complete picture. And so remaining open to new thoughts and new ideas, I think, is imperative no matter what you're looking at. There is this whole concept that we've worn these paths before that history repeats itself. And I would argue that that's not exactly true. I think it's something that we've been told time and again, and it it feels true. It feels like cycles repeat themselves, but never quite in the same way. And so if we are to learn anything, I think it's that we don't know everything and we should 
just continue to stay open. With regard to Neanderthals, I would just say, if you do decide to study them, study them with a kind mind, you know, understand that human history is really interesting. There's so much to it, but we're not unique in the challenges we face. We are, in a sense, just like the chipmunk that's trying to survive today out in their natural habitat. The primary difference between us is that, hey, we can we can build a house and build in air conditioning and <laughs> cyclic heat. It doesn't mean that we're all that different. So I think that's it. That's really what I want to say about history. We found each other on Facebook. It was a group on Facebook, and it had nothing to do with podcasting, but you had said, I don't even remember what the group was. And you said something about your podcast, and then we started talking, and then we connected, and and then you extended, you know, a hand and said, oh, I'd love to talk to you. And I was like, oh, yeah, because I'm still new at this, and I'm always interested to talk to other podcasters about how they do what they do, what they're doing. Can I fit them as, in as guests to talk about their favorite history? And we had a couple conversations since then to now, and one of the things that I noticed is, as you would talk about your history and probably also from listening to the podcast, but it seems like everything that you have done from your undergrad studying the Neanderthal to today and what you're doing, the things that you are doing, because you're not just doing one thing. Mm -hmm. If you looked at it, it would have been the perfect design to leave you to lead you to where you are today. So I want you to talk a little bit about that history, what happened after your undergraduate. And then I want you to talk about uh, the podcast, because I feel like the podcast came about because of all these other things that were a part of your life. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. And I appreciate the invitation to tell my story. I mean, it's not always easy to describe what choices you made along the way and why. I studied anthropology and archaeology in school because uh, it's kind of a silly story, but my dad was putting pressure on me to go into the sciences. Like he knew that I loved biology and I really loved the life sciences, everything animal related I was really into. And so he's like, honey, but these are growing fields. Why not become a biotechnologist? You could do this. And I'm like, dad, but I hate math. Like I can't do this. And I was an avid reader. I loved just reading literature and writing. And so I wanted to study English and literature. And he's like, no, no, he didn't want to fund that. And it's not like he was giving me a lot of money for college, but he was giving me some of it. So I compromised on anthropology after taking Tiza Absher Walker's class, right? And then four years later, I'm graduating. I've done a couple of archaeology digs in um, Western Europe and France, as well as in Central California. And I knew I loved it. I mean, I loved digging in the dirt, exploring it, the site, trying to discover something new, spending the time in the lab and, you know, cataloging what you'd found and writing about it. I loved all of it. But I also didn't have the money that I would need to fund an education for a PhD. And in the world of anthropology, this is something that's a little unfortunate, but it's not super funded specifically archaeology and prehistory this you know you're relying on endowments and things like that to help fund education but it's expensive so what did i do i chose to go to work and try to figure out what i would do next and maybe i would be able to pay down my college debt and get enough money to go and pursue my phd one day so i decided to go out into the workforce and i had five things that i wanted from a job i would take i hoped that it would helped me continue to learn because I wanted to always learn. I hoped that it would be rooted in some way in the sciences so that my inquisitive mind could be, you know, really kind of scratched at. I wanted to make sure that if anything, I was doing good, like in some way putting good out into the world. I also wanted to be, earn $15 an hour or more. So that was the financial piece. <laughs> it's not a lot of money, but, you know, as a recent college grad in 1998, it was kind of slim pickings. We were entering, you know, the bubble burst and all of that from Silicon Valley, which is where I'm based, right? And then lastly, I wanted not to fall in love with it. And that was, you know, wow. one of my five requirements. And I fell in love with it. I was working in the natural products industry. 
for an herbal extract company helping other companies to make finished products that would support people's health. And so I dug into the science. I learned about how over 100 different herbal extracts benefited health. I started to, you know, work with big companies and creating products that would benefit people. And I felt like, well, there here's the difference, you know, like I could have gone and studied archaeology. And what good would that really have done? Like, how would I have improved people's life by studying archaeology? But I'm improving people's life by creating products that support their health. I am helping to further my own education about nutrition and how it will impact my health and the lives of those around me that I love. So I'm doing good. I'm fulfilling all these other things. And now I'm also making a good living. So I guess I'm saying goodbye to scholastic life. <laughs> that was a conscious choice, right? Like, mm -hmm. but I missed education. I missed formal education. I loved being in school. I loved mm -hmm. seeking. And so 2019 hit. I had a disagreement with a CEO I was working with, and I wasn't able to get past it. And I said, you know what? I just want to go explore something else and chose to apply for and enroll in graduate school for business, which is what I've spent 20 years doing, and just kind of ratify and learn and, and see what I might need to know differently if I was to start my own business. And weirdly, I'm kind of deciding I don't necessarily want to be in that traditional business space. I want to do something different. So I'm kind of decided to go this podcast route because I want to put more good out into the world than I'm even able to through my work and highlight some of the social challenges and sustainability issues that we confront with the hope of inspiring people to get involved and, and maybe create their own effort to do some good in the world. So you're, you're doing a traditional MBA. What are you getting out of it, though, that's leading you into this path? Or have you already come into it? taking what you can get out of it and reformulating it into a way that's more meaningful that leads to what's the name of the podcast care more be better that has led you to this the ideas that are in the podcast you know I, I think about this at the end of every term right like each term is 10 weeks I've been going for this is my eighth I'm entering my eighth term eighth and final term I haven't taken summers off, so I'm completing it in, you know, two years. I've typically had between one and three weeks off between the terms. And every time I ask myself some simple questions, what did I learn and has it been worth it? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of simple, right? You know, I came to graduate school because I felt like there was a hole in my understanding with regard to how the financial back end of a business was run. I mean, I've been on the sales and marketing side. I've done a lot in cost analysis and building projections and, you know, all that other fancy stuff that you do within a business. And what I've often learned is that I knew more than I thought I did. And the holes in my knowledge are in different spaces than I expected them to be. I expressed earlier that I hate math. And that is still true. But now I've had to learn calculus. And that was something I avoided like the plague when I was in undergrad. I mean, I just took the bare minimum. I got through statistics and that was it because I had such a hard time. Even I tried to pass algebra two trigonometry and I couldn't get past it. Now, the mathematics I understand, at least on a theoretic level, is so much more advanced than I had anticipated. I don't know that it's all that usable, to be frank technology has come so far that, you know, I, I joked with another marketer in another class and said, you know, I think we'd be fired if we tried to do it this way, like all the longhand, you know, like there's, <laughs> there's cheap tools out there that can do all this stuff for you. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I think the thing that has given me more than anything is the time to reflect and think about what I don't know and continue opening my mind and reading case studies that are really interesting, thinking through problems and meeting other like-minded individuals who are trying to work through similar problems in their own lives. I mean, that's given me more than I think I had anticipated before, just the new connections I've built. You found out that you know more than you thought you knew. Yeah. And 
you're forging meaningful connections with like-minded people who have similar ideas. And so tell us about the podcast that in how did that evolve and you know where did you get the idea to do it and what it's about okay so this actually started a couple of years ago before i started graduate school i met with a girlfriend of mine from a prior job we worked together at nordic naturals and she was the marketing manager and i was a sales and education leader we were sitting down over a long cup of coffee and she said you know, I was thinking at the time I was going to build a company that was going to create products that gave back to bees in some way, like so supporting the health of bees. And I was going to call the company Care More, Be Better, and be like B-E-E, better. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I have the URL for Care More, Be Better, too. <laughs> um, and she said to me, but Karina, you know, as long as I've known you, You've always had this desire to help those that can't help themselves, and but your passions have kind of been all over the place. And she's like, and I'm not saying that as a criticism, but it's like, you want to help the, the sea turtle, you rescued a horse from, you know, a racetrack, and that's your horse, or you decided to get a rescue animal for this, like you're, you're don't want to support puppy mills. And you're like, you know, always thinking about all these more mindful ecological ways to live. What if you were to do something different, like maybe you could help match companies to these not for profits or something along those lines. And so I was chewing on that for a long time and deciding whether or not that was something I actually wanted to do. Do I want to spend time trying to create a monetization path for myself as work for that? Like, do I want to pitch companies with a service like that? And I, I just didn't feel like it was right for me in a way. And so it was this fall, I started listening to a particular podcast. And I had not been a podcast consumer. And I suddenly was listening to podcasts every time I was out for a walk with my dog, or every time I was at the gym, or every time I was, you know, doing chores around the house. And then I was discovering new podcasts and another one and another one. And I felt like they were feeding my brain and getting me to think in different ways and bringing up different passions and just making me feel like I had more full days. Like my life felt more complete. And I think part of the reason that my life felt more complete really has to do with COVID. Like we've been so disconnected over the course of the last year, not being able to meet with my girlfriends and have, you know, weird conversations about just the thing that came into our mind that day. Living on Zoom or, or on a phone hasn't provided that same experience for me. But when I was listening to some of these podcasts, I was finding myself getting that same itch scratched. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to put more good out into the world, maybe I can use podcasts to do that. Maybe I can use my skills as a marketer and also as a storyteller to, you know, help amplify the good that some of these companies are already doing. Or some of these inspired individuals, maybe I can get over some of the hurdles I have. Like, I don't really love networking with people I don't know, but this podcast gave me an excuse to do it. And now I'm meeting incredible people like yourself, but tell great stories and that I did. Oh, <laughs> it's true though. I think you're one of the kindest people I've met. Like you criticize yourself earlier and you're saying, <laughs> oh, you're kinder than me. And I'm just thinking, <laughs> I don't know that that's true. I mean, I feel like yeah. you are are, you know, really a gentle soul. And um, that's just um, a compliment. That's from me very to you. kind. Thank you. That means a lot to me. So I felt like, you know, if I could tell some stories, and also, in so doing, put some good into the world and inspire other people to act, or to open their minds, to see their neighbor down the street a little differently, to consider the homeless person that's living on the street and not think first that they're there by choice that mm -hmm. suddenly I could be changing things a little bit. That's the hope anyway. 
So tell us about the podcast. You know, what is the premise and I look at it the like of it. Yeah, I look at care more, be better as a it's an invitation. I'm inviting the audience to care more about a particular issue on each podcast show so that we can be better. And it takes we to be better. It's not something I can do on my own. It's not something they can do on their own. So I I consider it an invitation to a community of people that are going to support a better future. I consider it an invitation to think about something differently, to stretch yourself. I feel like if that's the gift that I have to leave the world with, it will be something. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do because I feel like I'm putting myself out there in a way that's way more revealing than I'm typically comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you encounter that yourself too, but it's been something for me to get used to. I guess I haven't really thought about it a lot. Uh, You do do that. I think you allow yourself to be vulnerable. I was just re-listening to, you you mentioned Love Without Borders. Mm -hmm which I'm really interested in talking to you about. Is it Kara? Yeah, it's Kara Martinez. Kara Martinez. Mm-hmm. She works with refugees, basically, and she provides them with the opportunity to create art, and then she sells their art. That's one of the, the parts of it, I know. Right. I think there's more to mm-hmm. it. Which And you can find, I'll put a link, too, because I was just looking at the art, trying to figure out which piece to buy because they have an Etsy shop, but that's, you know, neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. I've gotten something out of every single episode that you've put out. I think I'm caught up. Wow. Well, thank Um, you. And I think (laughs) I've listened, I've re-listened to a couple of them, you know, to prepare for the podcast, to to prepare for this interview, but also because they're very uh, compelling and I get something new out of them every time I listen to them. And I like it because it can be really daunting. I was just having this conversation with uh, my boyfriend the other day. Actually, I think it was this morning. And it's this idea, well, what can we do? And it feels overwhelming when you think about, you know, the fractures Mm. of the world and that type of thing. But you break it down into little bite-sized pieces and you say, well, this person is doing this. And, you know, you could buy a piece of artwork and, you know, that's not overwhelming. That's not daunting. And they're lovely pieces and there's such a great story behind them. Or, you know, just supporting a local charity or donating your time. I mean, like the thing that I keep wanting to tell, I I want to interview people that are in their early phases often in developing their businesses Mm -hmm. because, you know, it reveals that each of us can be the change that we want to see. And, and it's, and it starts to make it feel less alien, I think, and less like you're staring at Mount Everest, because I think that's the biggest challenge I run into when I'm tackling a big problem. You know, it's, it looks so big and you have to break it down. I think it's exactly what you were saying. And I think you bring us that and all those little pieces of your past have equated to this. It seems like, isn't that funny how, when we get to a certain perch in our life and we look back on all the times that we're, we were so uncertain and we weren't sure if we were making the right choices. I don't know if this happens (laughs) to you, but this happens to (laughs) me. And it's like, and then I have this moment of enlightenment and it's like the angels sing and it's like, well, that's why that happened so that I could do this. And I don't know. I don't know if I believe that idea, but it feels like serendipity, right? Like it's just, yeah, serendipity seems like it's yeah. supposed to happen because in a way, because it is maybe. Yeah. I've I've had many of those moments in the past year. I've also had moments where everything just felt hard. I have two young boys, three and six, right? And, you know, at the time I, when COVID first hit, I was in my, just almost completing my first year of graduate school. I was really committed to it. And I suddenly looked at this and said, this could cripple me what am I going to do? Am I going to suddenly stop working on my contract work and pull out of grad school and just be here with my kids all the time because the daycare is shutting and this, that, and the next thing? A lot of women had to make that choice. Mm -hmm. I was able to tap a friend on the shoulder and get her to move in with me short term, which ended up being over half a year. 
to help support our household and make everything work while we adjusted to a kids at home and Zoom class lifestyle that was really Mm -hmm. hard. And there were days in that where we had more bickering than any of us wanted and just sick of seeing one another's faces without a break. (laughs) Oh, I hear you. I don't have kids, but I have a partner, a domestic partner. Yeah. And uh, it it was challenging. It is challenging. Well, I think when the kids finally were able to go back to school, they were so much happier because, I mean, they got to spend time with other kids. And I mean, I say school for my three-year-old. It's a preschool, but it's so good for them to have other kids to play with. Like, you're never going to be the same as that for them. You'll never be able to do that. Right. So, you know, I'm just thankful that at this phase, you know, I'm I'm coming out of grad school. I'm almost done. I've created Yay, this. Congratulations. Yeah, it's amazing. That's huge. I'm, uh, I'm really proud of just doing it because, I mean, I am... You know, you mentioned, you know, oh, this is what led me here. Well, I've had those moments that are opposite of that, which is just like doubt, yes, I was, you know. As I was saying it, I was thinking the same the same thing. So, yeah. You know, like, okay, so I'm 44 and I, you know, I'm proud that I'll be finishing this before my 45th birthday. But at the same time, you know, I'm double the age of many of the students in these classes. And I get to bring with me a different perspective in the history that I've been able to glean from a professional perspective to the scholastic work, which is all great. But it also means that I understand the experience I'm having in this graduate program is much different than the one they're having. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's just part of trying to remain aware of what your experience is versus the experience of others around you, I think keeping that perspective is is helpful and helps to reduce one's own prejudices. Wow. That's quite an interesting path. And I'm I'm excited to see where you go with it. Also, the other thing that you do that I read about is that you also do brand development, so you're talking about contracts. Mm-hmm. And you do CSR planning sessions. What's CSR? Oh, yeah. See, is. corporate social responsibility. That's it, right? I did know that. And I think that, especially in this climate of the pandemic, we've all had to pivot. That's the word, pivot, right? Which means we've all had to be creative about our resources and looking at them and seeing the context they're in and, mm-hmm. you know, making use of them, basically, is what it is. And I think you've definitely done that. I've done that with the podcast as well, with what I'm doing, uh, because I had the opportunity to do it and I saw it. And so you did that and you capitalized on it. And it could go so many different ways. Do you like doing the podcast? Well, I love it. I think otherwise I wouldn't be spending as much time on it. (laughs) (laughs) We've released now, I think this week will be nine episodes when we're when you and I are okay. recording. And I've recorded 16. I have number 17 coming up here in just a little bit. So I've been working to build a bank so that I can take this last term of school without really stressing about it too much. Smart. Because this one's going to be yeah. quite hefty and I don't want to lose momentum. You know, I'm not monetizing it. And I think that's a big difference too. Like a lot of people, if you're in these podcasting rooms are saying, how are you making money at it? This, that, and the next thing. And you know, at least presently, that's not my plan. I really do look at it as my effort to put more good out into the world. And it's kind of stoking these passions in me that I don't necessarily Mm -hmm. get a chance to exercise in my everyday otherwise. So I think that's Mm -hmm. healthy from a brain perspective. You know, I think about something else. My father-in-law is going to be 90 next month. Okay. You interviewed him. Yeah. Is that the the sight guy. Okay, yeah, corneal yeah, dystrophy. Yeah. So he has a foundation for that. And, you know, he is one of the most vibrant, smart, quick-witted individuals I've ever met at almost 90, right? I haven't seen, I met him, you know, over 15 years ago now as I was dating my husband. And I have not seen a mental decline remotely in him. And I think that is largely due to the fact that he's constantly seeking, working, reading, you know, he hasn't given up. He's, you know, not kind of doing the traditional, what you would consider retired lifestyle of a 90 year old. He's still the executive director of this company, helping people to solve their site challenges. 
And he's motivated by that and he's connected to it and working at it constantly. So, you know, perhaps this will become the thing that long term keeps my brain quick witted and strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want my audience to know about or something that you just remembered that you wanted to share? Well, heck, I'd just really like to invite people to connect with me if you have thoughts about, you know, particular social impact causes or uh, sustainability issues you'd like to see featured on Care More Be Better. I mean, you can always just reach out to me directly. I'm at caremorebebetter.com. If you're curious about Neanderthal history, I'm always ready, willing, and able to have a conversation about it because I just am so intrigued by the idea that like a fish swimming in a stream, we had another species of human sitting alongside us for 30,000 years. We just don't have that equivalent anymore. So I'm, I'm just always and forever curious about what that would have been like. I really enjoyed talking to you, Karina. Thank you for giving us your time and your knowledge and, you know, just sharing this fascinating history that I don't think, you know, I... I never thought about Neanderthals being on the show. So here we go. Thank you. Well, it's been my pleasure. I really enjoy listening to your podcast. So I'm honored to be featured on it. It's so lovely. Oh, thank you. Well, yours is definitely a, a subscription. It's in queue. So I enjoy listening to yours as well. You have some really great content. And I love, I love your interviews. I love the way that you approach your guests. And so I really urge my listeners to uh, listen to care more, be better. Well, thank you so much. There you have it. Karina Belizzi and the often misunderstood Neanderthal. For more on Karina, her podcast, care more, be better and the Neanderthal. Please check out our episode notes. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.